Good morning. It's really nice to be back with you. And uh, I want to thank Marie for inviting me. I know that she is relaxing somewhere by the water today. Uh, I'm no stranger to Newark. Um, as a reminder, I mentioned this the last time I was here. I spent seven years working at the Center for Disability Studies at the university. And my older son is a proud graduate of the university. So it's always nice to come back here. And I'm going to go get the opening words. The call to worship this morning are the words of Tanya Marquez. It is a wonder and mystery that our paths have crossed, that in the immensity of time, in the vastness of space, we coincide here. I am in awe at the ways in which our lives intersect and intertwine, at the beauty we create when we gather, May our coming together make us more compassionate, more just, more caring, and more loving. May our hearts and minds be open to this offering. Let us worship, let us marvel at the miracle of being here right now and the mystery that has brought us together. The words of Tanya Marquez. We light this symbol of our faith that as we respond individually to events around us, we intend our individual acts to combine toward building a positive and flourishing community. And this morning's reading is in the form of a parable written by David Horner. Faith and reason were brothers. More than that, they were best friends, and they did everything together. They wandered through fields and forests, embarked on great adventures, explored, learned, discovered, created, together, always together. Reason and faith were inseparable. Now, that's not to say that they were identical. Each had his own unique personality. Faith was the adventurous one. He was always looking to the horizon, peering into the distance. Faith had an ability to imagine the possibilities of where the two brothers might go and what they could do. And when Faith went for it, he went all the way. He was fully in. Faith trusted people. He trusted ideas. He followed visions and dreams and possibilities. Reason was different. He focused on what is, not on what could be or might be. Reason would always ask really hard questions about whether someone could be trusted or whether those woods were safe. He tested the bridges that Faith wanted to cross to see whether they could hold them up. Reason would constantly ask his brother questions like, what do you mean by that? How do you know that? How does this work? Faith risked and trusted and committed. Reason tested and evaluated and questioned. Together they were a great team. They needed each other. Without reason asking his tough questions, Faith might go out into the darkness and get lost. Without Faith's vision and energy, reason would be stuck. He might never move ahead or take any risks. And so faith and reason lived and worked together happily for years and years. One day, a new friend moved into the neighborhood. Her name was Enlightenment. Enlightenment like reason, but she wasn't too crazy about faith. You see, Enlightenment was threatened by reason's friendship with faith, and she was determined to undo the relationship. You don't need faith, she told Reason. Faith is dangerous. He's bad company, a loose cannon. Why do you let him lead you where he wants you to go? You need to call your own shots. Reason listened to enlightenment, and slowly he began to pull away from his brother. 
As this happened, Faith was very sad, but then he realized that this might be a good opportunity for him. I need to be more independent. I can finally, truly be myself without reason constantly slowing me down, holding me back with his irritating questions. And so it happened that a wedge was driven between faith and reason, which grew into a deep divide. Faith and reason's loving friendship and partnership fell apart, and thus it remains to this day. In the opening reading, I shared the story of Faith and Reason, two brothers who were once inseparable but grew apart through the doings of a third, Enlightenment, who believed that science and logic were more valuable than spirituality and religion. If truth be told in many, nay most, maybe all of our Unitarian Universalist congregations, there is also a great deal of sibling rivalry where faith and reason do not walk hand in hand, where we do not embark on great adventures together, where we don't explore, discover, and learn together. This battle between faith and reason, between, for purposes of this sermon, I'll call theists and humanists, those who lean on faith versus those who lean on reason, is played out in many ways in our congregations. We argue incessantly, for example, over the word God or mentioning Jesus in our sermons. We bicker over whether it's okay for Unitarian Universalists to pray or even to use the word. We debate what the concept of spirituality means and recognize that it is a turnoff for some. I have no idea what spirituality even is, a member of one congregation said to me a few months ago during a congregational retreat. I even began a planning session with a congregation one time to create a covenant of right relations, and I got major pushback from a few participants who argued vehemently that we should not use the word covenant because in their words, it was too biblical. In her 2016 General Assembly sermon, the Reverend Nancy McDonald Ladd referred to these as fake fights, fake fights. Arguments that Unitarian Universalists get into, which serve to distract us from the critical conversations that we should be having conversations like how do we better care for one another? How do we care for a broken world? How do we overcome the tyranny of racial, social, and economic injustice in our polarized society? As Reverend Nancy says in her sermon, we are still fighting about who's a humanist and who's a theist as those two terms are mutually exclusive in the first place. It's fake to try to win some imaginary war about whose definition about God is right. My hope in delivering this message this morning is that we begin to understand that faith and reason, as Reverend Nancy suggests, are not mutually exclusive, and that we UUs have more in common than we might think. Let's start by defining our terms. Strictly speaking, a theist is one who believes in the existence of a god or gods, specifically of a creator who intervenes in the universe. While not all theists who are Unitarian Universalists may profess to believing in a god, they do view life through a spiritual lens and believe that some events can be attributed to a force beyond scientific understanding or the laws of nature. They are open to the mystery of things that go beyond what we can see or reason. A humanist, on the other hand, is one who attaches greater importance to human rather than divine or supernatural matters. Humanism, according to the Bristol Humanist Group, 
is an approach to life based on reason and our common humanity, recognizing that moral values are properly founded on human nature and experience alone. Philosopher Ron Steelman defines the difference in this way. In considering any type of spiritual experience, the theist may see it as a religious experience, a manifestation of the spiritual realm, perhaps of the divine. The humanist would say it is a subjective human experience available to anyone taking place in a human brain triggered by a complex combination of external sensory inputs and internal memories and processes and has nothing to do with the spiritual realm or deity, both of which humanists think are imaginary. Those who are extreme in one or another of these polar beliefs often go to their respective corners and come out fighting. The scientist and author Isaac Asimov, who was not a Unitarian Universalist, but reportedly did attend UU services from time to time, wrote that, quote, I have never, not for one moment, been tempted toward religion of any kind. I have my philosophy of life, which does not include any aspect of the supernatural and which I find totally satisfying. I am, in short, a rationalist, and I believe only that which reason tells me is so. As an aside, Asimov was once interviewed by talk show host David Frost. Remember him? Those two youngins along with me. At one point in the interview, in an attempt to probe Asimov about his religious beliefs, Frost asked, surely a man of your diverse intellectual interests and wide-ranging curiosity must have tried to find God. Smiling pleasantly, Asimov responded, God is much more intelligent than I am. Let him try to find me. <laughs> Another man of science, Albert Einstein, attempted to bridge the gap between reason and faith. In 1936, a little girl from New York named Phyllis sent the following letter to Einstein. The Riverside Church, January 19, 1936. My dear Dr. Einstein, we have brought up the question, do scientists pray in our Sunday school class? It began by asking whether we could believe in both science and religion. We are writing to scientists to try and have our own question answered. We will feel greatly honored if you will answer our question, do scientists pray and what do they pray for? We are in the sixth grade, Miss Ellis's class. Respectfully yours, Phyllis. Only five days later, Einstein wrote back, January 24th, 1936, dear Phyllis, I will attempt to reply to your question as simply as I can. Here is my answer. Scientists believe that every occurrence, including the affairs of human beings, is due to the laws of nature. Therefore, a scientist cannot be inclined to believe that the course of events can be influenced by prayer, that is, by a supernaturally manifested wish. However, we must concede that our actual knowledge of these forces is imperfect, so that in the end, the belief in the existence of a final ultimate spirit rests on a kind of faith. Such belief remains widespread, even with the current achievements in science. He continues, but also everyone who is seriously involved in the pursuit of science becomes convinced that some spirit is manifest in the laws of the universe, one that is vastly superior to that of man. In this way, the pursuit of science leads to a religious feeling of a special sort, which is surely quite different from the religiosity of someone more naive. With cordial greetings, your A. Einstein. What a politician, huh? <laughs> It's interesting that despite his attempts to marry 
faith and reason, Einstein couldn't resist taking a crack at those who, whose religiosity he considered, quote, more naive. So, fellow brothers and sisters, are we as Unitarian Universalists doomed for all eternity to struggle in our attempt to coexist in these seemingly polar opposite worlds? Must the brothers' faith and reason remain separate for all eternity, never to explore or learn together again? Well, if that was the message this morning, this sermon would be over, and you would be able to get on with the rest of your day. No such luck. The philosopher Richard Jacob Bernstein, no relation, as far as I know, could even be Bernstein for all, <laughs> sees no incompatibility between faith and reason, but rather an ultimate harmony. Faith is not opposed to reason, he writes. Rather, it requires the full development of reason. And reason itself requires faith in order to strengthen, guide, and supplement its inherent limitations. Faith and reason, he suggests, go together like a horse and carriage. Faith, my friends, is the act of believing in something unseen for which we do have a good reason. Believing in something unseen for which we do have a good reason. This is the essence of what Pope John Paul II meant when he wrote, faith and reason are like two wings on which the human spirit rises to the contemplation of truth. We cannot know the truth about ourselves and the world unless we have faith and utilize reason. Here's an example. When the pandemic, pandemic was in full bloom, the evidence was clear that the various vaccines developed to combat COVID-19 were effective and still are. We saw this through the reduction in infectious cases, the reduction in hospitalizations, the reduction in deaths. But when I was first vaccinated, low those many years ago, I was not able to see the serum enter my body and begin its work. I had to have faith that the shot would be administered competently and that the vaccine would protect me against the virus. Without faith in the science, all the reason in the world would not have gotten me to the table. The author Robert Harris puts it this way, faith is the foundation for all knowledge and must come first. We must have faith in the source of the knowledge, faith in the book, the instructor, the writer, the speaker. Faith depends on trust and you must trust the authority and the veracity of the statements that claim to be knowledge or you cannot ever gain knowledge. And rather, and writer Greg Kukai tells us that reason assesses, faith trusts. Reason assesses whether or not something or someone is trustworthy and then faith believes that certain things are true in light of the reasons. Reason assesses, faith trusts. It is why some people choose not to get the COVID vaccine. It is why many people continue to believe that the 2020 election was stolen. I could go on and on. They see the same evidence that we do, but they don't trust the evidence. They don't trust the source. It is not reason that takes away their faith. It is their subjective emotions or their imagination, and it is their lack of trust. Consider the girl learning to swim. She knows perfectly well that a human body will not necessarily sink in water because she has seen dozens of people float and swim. But the question becomes, will she continue to believe this when the instructor takes away her hand and leaves her unsupported in the water? Or will she suddenly cease to believe it, become frightened, and go under? Reason assesses, faith trusts. Look, wherever you fall on this faith-reason continuum, the important point is that in Unitarian Universalist lore, 
There is more that we have in common than what separates us. This is from the Humanist Unitarian Universalist webpage, the Humanist UU webpage. We are religious in that we share with most Unitarian Universalists the natural human desire for a beloved and accepting community, a purpose greater than ourselves, rituals and practices that resonate with our common humanity and shared mortality, and opportunities to work with other tough-minded, warm-hearted people to do good in the world and to help one another attain the greatest possible fulfillment in life. This is what we all want, regardless of what we believe or how we see the world. If we can, in our congregations, use reason to assess what we need and then have faith and trust in each other in carrying it out, we will move closer to the ideal of a beloved community. And brother, do we need that now. <laughs>